But what makes the magic in what we do is life experiences. You've got to go out and do something else to be able to tell stories. And if you have no stories, you won't be successful. If you have no library of thoughts to share with others, then you have no future in this. This is Brand Story, a podcast featuring in-depth conversations with leaders, marketers, and brand storytellers about their professional journey and the impact they're making on the world around them. Welcome to Brand Story. I'm your host, Steve Gilman, and my guest today is Van Graves. Van became the executive director of the VCU Brand Center in 2018, and he was previously the chief creative officer at J. Walter Thompson, executive vice president and global executive creative director at Macon, New York, and vice president and creative director of BBDNO in New York. He's a Fulbright scholar, a decorated combat veteran. He holds degrees from Howard University, the Pratt Institute, Harvard University, and the University of Pennsylvania. So you really just haven't been doing much, right, Van? <laughs> wow. I, so I never lived my life with all of those things rolled out like that. So yeah. that was just awkward and uncomfortable. But yeah, was it weird to have now. someone just <laughs> say like your mom. accolades at you? Exactly. Yeah. yeah, it's like my mom, like, oh, yeah, I just need to make sure that everything is right for my baby. And you write <laughs> all the things. And by the way, in third grade, he was amazing. So right. Yeah, no, we were going to go all the way back to third grade, but, you know, all the first prize in this and third prize in that got a little, it, it was a little much. No, hey, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, given some of the folks you've had on before, just to be able to sit here and talk to you, I truly appreciate it. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, it's an honor to have you on. And, you know, I've had several people from the Brand Center on because I'm a huge fan of the Brand Center and I have friends that work there. And so Scott Whithouse is a longtime friend of mine. He's your you know, professor of visual storytelling down there. Uh, Kelly O'Keefe has been on, um, you know, so he's highly involved in brand management and creative with you all down there and teaching. And then Ken Marcus as well from the Martin Agency, who I think has taught some for you all. Yes, and still is. I mean, I mean, the roster that you're talking about, I mean, that's one of the blessings and honor of being at the Brand Center. They're active practitioners who are making things happen in the world and we're in, in the world in real time. And it's not just... We talk at students. We're training students in the trade, in the craft in real time. Yeah, I think the Brand Center is really unique. So just to get started, and I know you've had such a long career, and I'll ask you some questions about, you know, your past and and all the work you've done. But can you just tell the audience a little bit about the Brand Center and what the mission is and what you all try to do there? Because it's different than other programs like it. You know, our goal um, is to really inspire the next generation of creative leadership, um, that's to, to grow brands and bring innovations to life. We have, you know, we started off as the ad center um, uh, by our founder, Diane Cook Tench, who, um, you know, had this crazy idea um, at that time called the ad center. And she worked with President Trani to get it off the ground. Um, and I think that's important to mention because I stand on the shoulder of giants. I really do. And, you know, folks like Rick Boyko, who then came and kind of re-envisioned re how we exist in the world. And there have been different iterations of what the Brand Center is, but sticking to the core values of how are we preparing students for the future and for this industry. And the interesting thing about our industry at this point is it did start off as pure advertising, but then advertising, marketing, innovation, creativity has all collapsed on itself. And be it podcasts, be it AI, we're training students to be creative problem solvers so that no matter what the technology, no matter what the platform, they're ready. And one of the brilliant things about the Brand Center is, yes, we're the Brand Center, but we're part of a business school. And so we also have the fundamentals of business that our students learn as much as they learn creativity as well. Yeah, I think it's such a valuable program and there should be more like it. And one of the things that uh, I've always noticed about it is it's super unique to the world, period. And it's the best in class for teaching people to be creative problem solvers. And the the folks that come out, you you know, you're lucky if you get a brand center grad because they can think, they can problem solve. A hundred percent. And that and that's really where our sweet spot is. We're not an art school. We're not a trade school. We're not a business school. We're all of that and more. And that's where the brand center, we, you know, we're kind of the, the, the goofy kid in the corner. We have a lot of fun. And, you know, like you said, you know, Scott, like we enjoy what we do 
And, you know, another day at the brand center is never repeated. Like it's just all sorts of crazy any given day. And our students are dedicated and devoted to the craft. And I think we've gotten to a point um, where sometimes craftsmanship is not really shown or trained in a way that, you know, you really do need to understand the components to build something great. And we still focus in on that. And so there's been a lot of talk recently around chat GPT and uh, mid journey. And oh my gosh, it's going to take so much away from us. Like, well, if you're a critical thinker and you can create and problem solve, that's just another tool. No one's going to say all of a sudden, hey, oh my gosh, I need to pull out my pencil and paper and get rid of my computer. Like, no, you should be able to use your pencil and paper, your typewriter, your computer, and whatever else the next iteration is. Yeah, I, I love that you train people to think and problem solve and be creative because as much as business has changed in the world and the way that how, the speed that we all move at, being able to be a critical thinker and solve problems in real time and create and, you know, in this day and age, we're all storytellers, regardless of whether we do it for ourselves, for our companies, you know, whether you're just trying to get your program inside a company to do well, if you can't engage with other people and get them to follow along with you, you're not going to get a whole lot done in this day and age. That's exactly right. And that's one of the things we tell our students, you know, and I'm glad you said it this way, which is don't talk about being a storyteller, tell stories, you know, you know, and it's, it's, it's so important so again, but that's a part of the craft, right? Like you need to, there's art to telling a story and to build on and to really create that momentum around a brand or around a platform or a product. And so that's where we win and we're doing more than just the same old, same old. I think anyone that, that learns those skills, masters them, gets good at part of them or all of them. Any time that you can be a storyteller, not just announce to the world that you are one, um, but actually do it. I mean, if you think of every great leader, they were able to engage people through telling stories and getting them to believe something. So if we're trying to change minds, influence people, whatever it is, the skills you all teach speak directly to that. And I think it's a, I, th I wish more schools taught it, quite frankly. People talk about the brand sort of being best in class. I think it's important for me to acknowledge our faculty and staff are better in class. Like phenomenal and these folks are impressive i mean they, yeah, they really right. are and and are good people and i know that's i know that's just kind of a weird thing to say but having worked with them and know their passion and love for the students and what they do when they come in every day i mean i wouldn't trade it for the world and you know this has really come full circle for me for you i had read something about that the campus where the brand center is is the old carriage house for the jefferson and you have a family connection to that. Is that true? I do. Um, it's really funny. Well, you really did do your research, didn't you? Yeah, I sure did. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, so it's interesting. So when I got this role, I was talking to my grandmother, who has since passed. But she she asked me, like, where is this new gig? Because she was so excited I was coming back to Richmond. She could spend time with her, her grandkids. And I said, well, you know, on South Jefferson Street, down behind the, uh, the Jefferson Hotel, she goes to the carriage house and she's she like, yeah. And first of all, why do you know this? And where do you know the couch? She goes, well, your great grandfather used to work there. And so when I walk into the building, I have a different kind of a feeling, um, you know, because this is someone who worked at the Jefferson and worked his way up from the carriage house to work in the kitchen, to then become a doorman. And, you know, and sort of to now be a part of how that history has evolved, I mean, is, is very personal to me. And, and you're right, it's, a, it's a, a part of uh, bringing things back around. And my kids love coming to the building, love that history as well. Yeah, and for anyone that hasn't seen the Brand Center, we'll put a link to it. And, you know, the Jefferson Hotel is an historic hotel in Richmond, Virginia. The Brand Center, the old carriage house is a massive building and the Brand Center is a beautiful beautiful facility run by Virginia Commonwealth University. And, you know, just that, Van, that story is so wonderful. And, like, the fact that you end up there as the executive director and just how through the years, you know, that's a wonderful story. But, you know, in Richmond's a special place. And, you know, I think about, and, and I talk to folks about this, you know, I grew up in Richmond and 
people default very quickly to Richmond is the former capital of the Confederacy. And yes, you know, I, I, very much so. And what VCU has done, because when I was growing up here, VCU was just a small commuter school. And what I think that VCU has done for Richmond, being downtown, being centrally located, and bringing in, whether it be for the medical school or for the Monroe campus, is bring in the international flavor to Richmond that it never had before. And so to hear different languages being spoken as you walk across campus, to smell different foods, there's a different kind of culture that I don't think people expect from Richmond. Um, but even when we think about, uh, you know, 2020 and monuments coming down, the reason why is because the culture of Richmond is changing our world in the way that it never had been before. And it's an exciting place to be. And, you know, I wouldn't trade it. Yeah. And a lot of innovative, really forward thinking people have ended up there. So it's just a, an interesting, it, I feel like it's, there's a new Richmond that's been rebuilt and there's so many like really kind hearted, wonderful people doing the right thing there. And I think the brand center is a big part of that. And VCU is a big part of that because the spirit of Richmond certainly has changed over the years. You know, I've gone in and out of Richmond for years, so it's a really special place. It really is. And our students and, you know, across campus, um, they're our flavor. I mean, it's, that's what makes us great. That's really cool. So, you know, Mike Hughes, the former president of the Martin agency, um, he gave you some very valuable advice way back when. And I'm a huge Martin Agency fan, and I was a huge Mike Hughes fan. So what did he say to you, and how did that affect your life? So growing up in Richmond, I wanted to do this thing called advertising. My family is from here. That you know, And, and trying to explain what we actually do is not really as easy as you would think. And so my parents were like, well, so you, you want to be an artist and how are you going to pay your bills? I mean, this art director thing, I'm like, no, 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 no. I want to be an art director for an ad agency. So you want to be a businessman or teach business. Well, yeah, sort of maybe. And so which led to my undergraduate degree being in, in marketing because the only thing that I could convince them was one day keep the lights on. Um, and, and, you know, I was encouraged to speak to this guy, Mike Hughes, who I didn't know worked at an agency. I didn't know, um, because again, a kid growing in Richmond, Martin was known outside and everywhere. Virginia's for lovers. But as a kid growing up, you know, I'm 17 years old and met with him and he was pretty simple. He's like, you need to leave. You need to get out of town. I mean, I could hire you here and you could work your way up, but what makes the magic in what we do is life experiences. You've yeah. got to go out and do something else to be able to tell stories to your earlier point. And if you have no stories, you won't be successful. If you have no library of thoughts to share with others, then you have no future in this. So I took his advice. I ended up going to uh, undergrad in DC, which was great for a kid coming out of Richmond because I didn't realize, especially at that time, Richmond was kind of a town pretending to be a city. And I'd never been on anything that even resembled the subway. And some folks, especially in New York, would be like, well, the metro in D.C. is not a subway. But for me, it was. that was huge. Yeah, exactly. Sure. <laughs> and so but it was a great primer for when I did go to New York and really kind of understand how to navigate and learn and also not be the guy who looks at people in the eye and say hello yeah. in New York City. <laughs> Because people don't like that. It's no, not weird. so much. <laughs> you can't do that same thing. Exactly. I mean, you but can you learn do it, Virginia. But, but someone will call the police on you. So. Yeah. yeah, I love that. I love what he told you. I love that you went and did it. I think that's amazing. And, uh, you know, obviously, you know, you've had incredible success out there in the world beyond Richmond and then somehow ended up back in Richmond. It's very cool. That part wasn't written in the story, by the way. Like, <laughs> I didn't. I actually didn't think the whole circular thing was going to happen. Um, and you know, and, and it, and I, and I want to be clear to, especially to your listeners that yes, it sounds like a pretty complete story and this guy, mm -hmm. there are ups and downs and yeah. student loans all in there. Right. So there's a, there's a whole lot of other things that were happening, but you know, it has really come together. Um, and I would not, I think about successes in my career and things that I have done, you know, 
it's, you know, other than having kids, like the brand center is that thing. And, yeah. oh, sweetheart, and getting married. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> good, that, good that you got that one in there. Because if oh she listens goodness. and you didn't mention it, you'd be in a lot oh of trouble. Man. Yeah. Oh, my God. I would. I, you know, I'm shocked my phone's not ringing already. Right. Yeah. So, <laughs> no, but the brand center is really, you know, when I think about all the things I've done in my career, the brand center um, has really been the high point. Man, that's great to hear. It's so great when someone ends up doing something that's so close to their heart and brings, you know, their expertise back to the city they grew up in. I just think that's very cool. And, you know, you mentioned something that I've talked to other creative leaders about. You know, I talked to Patricia Corsi, who's the global CMO for Bear, and she talked about that the one quality and the one thing that she would recommend to anyone who is young in this industry is to travel and to see things from pe other people's point of view. And so, you know, it's kind of the same advice you got. I think it's because when you're trying to pull together an idea, you know, you need to have more than just your own perspective. You can't just look at things from just your perspective. So how much, how much does that, that feeling and that the thinking about empathy and trying to instill that in students, part of what you try to do at the Brand Center? It's interesting. Students today are even very, very different than they were five years ago. And so the, the world has changed so much. And so, you know, we have, we do a lot to explain them. Like you have to be culturally sensitive. You have to have a little empathy. Um, you know, we can't do and say things and express ideas the way we used to, but what it has done for our students, which I think is, has been really amazing is they have to think even more. Right. So it actually pushes them. There's no shorthand now. Right. So, um, you know, to sit with students and say, well, a guy and a girl walk into it. Well, why is it a guy and a girl? Tell yeah, me why. Like, right. And, you know, it's like, that's great. OK, I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. And, you know, or you, you, you know, you, you create some art and you're like, well, why are they blonde? I don't know. Like and and you and, and they talk about things that our professors are learning, our staff are learning or, it's, you know, well, here's what bias is and be careful on how you do that, how you communicate wider to the wider audience. And, you know, one of the things that um, we really focus on is grace. I'm, you know, I'm an old guy who is, and you see all the memes, right? You know, I'm Gen X and, you know, they, there's an X. We were so bad. They didn't even have a name for us. They gave us X and they are sensitive enough. And so it's like, hey, guys, I may screw up. I might say the wrong thing please show me some grace, but don't let me off the hook. Help me learn, understand that's not coming from a bad place. And we share those things and we all learned through that process. And I fumble sometimes, they fumble sometimes, but, the, but pressure produces diamonds. And in learning more about each other and each student has a very different cultural experience, it, it, there's such a value to that. And so we really push that with our students, you know, don't, don't stop at the first idea because the first idea has already been done 10 times. So the only way you can push any idea or any creative thought is to have real experiences, to challenge, to dare to question. And that's really what we push for our students. That's so great. I mean, you all basically have a culture of being empathic and, you know, sharing that with each other, which is gonna change how they behave in the world when they leave and you know, change you all while it's happening. I think that was really cool. So talking about the work that you're preparing them for, whether it's an agency or it's in uh, some sort of internal business unit or it's in marketing, wherever they end up, but you know, the agency world is changing a lot. You've been in it. What, you know, with all the changes agencies are going through with pitching and all the different things, what, what's something that you would change about the agency world at this point? I think, you know, I, I think that because of technology, um, and because of where we're going, I think, I think the agency model as it sits needs to be different. Right. And I think it needs to be different based on what we're making. You know, we always start with this idea of traditional versus, you know, digital. Well, digital has been around for a very long time. It's traditional. Now you got to yeah. start with that too. And so really saying, what are the great ideas, no matter what platform they live in. And I think the, I think the other piece is sometimes in the agency world, we follow instead of lead. 
And I think there's huge opportunity now from an innovation standpoint, to not just talk about innovation, but to be innovative and make some of these products and build some things and going to the client with a ready-made thing to say, hey, this would work for your brand. And I think, because again, technology has allowed us to shorten the process and create things in real time. And so literally the word agency, let's have some agency around what we put out in the world versus giving them what they're asking for. I love that. And then also just the, you know, when you've been doing something a certain way and agency ha- agencies have their structure a certain way, they do ideas a certain way, it moves up the chain a certain way. It's really the opposite of innovation a lot of times. And, you know, how they interact with clients through briefs, you know, sometimes it can be quicker. It can be, you know, like come from the agency with ideas and innovations. And so, yeah, I think that's great. It's a wonderful perspective. And I hope the industry starts to embrace that a little bit more. Here's the thing. I think that the industry will because evolution will require it. I mean, it's, it's, it's business is evolving. Expectations are evolving. Budgets are shrinking. <laughs> so everything else, expectations are growing while budgets are shrinking. And so the expectation of clients, of business leaders, they want more for less. And how do you do that? in a classic agency model. It's it's not sustainable. Yeah, it isn't. And it's, you know, a, a scrappier, simpler model, I think, is going to be what prevails in the long run. So y- you've been a leader in so many different ways. Um, you know, you have a military background, but you ended up in creative, which is unusual. So I'd love to know what, what how did you put those two things together? Because I don't think it happens that often. Well, actually, I was in New York, um, a creative in, um, in an agency. I was working at BBDO at the time and September 11th happened. And, uh, that actually that morning, um, in 2001, I was supposed to fly up to, uh, to see a client in Boston and someone called me and said, Hey Van, you know, um, a plane just hit the, one of the towers. I don't think your flight's going to go. And you turn on the news, it looked like it was like a small little Cessna or something, something tiny had hit. And we're, you know, debating back and forth on what it is. And the second plane hit. Um, and I and I think at that moment, the friend of mine that I was talking to realized that this is bigger than what we thought. And I got off the phone and took care of a couple of things and then went to the recruiter. So I. And, and, and this is not, and I want to be clear, this is not to, oh, well, Van Graves is a hero and he did all that. I felt it, I felt it an obligation. Um, I was lucky to have parents that were, you know, they, they believed in service. So they looked at, and, and, and still, you know, America as a bowl. Look, we're here to, you can take things out of that bowl, but at some point you've got to give back. And that was my way of giving back because again, I was living my American dream. I left Richmond, Virginia with the coaxing of Mike Hughes to go out and work in advertising. You can do it. And at that point I was a vice president creative director at the top agency BBDO in New York city at their flagship. Like I was living that American dream as a proof point. And I felt compelled, you know, and that way, you know, and I didn't, feel like other people had to do it. And there were folks that I worked with that were like, why would you do that? Um, You know, there was already a movie done around this, but I'm going to tell you the humor is the 33 year old ad guy who goes to basic (laughs) training with a bunch of 17 year olds. I bet that was different. Oh, was it? Um, You know, I was called old man. I mean, I was, I mean I'm, I'm their parents' age, right? Like it was a fascinating understanding about, again, the world we live in and learning about people. And it was, it was an opportunity for me to grow. Um, and, you know, and I spent some time um, deployed in Iraq and, and I came home. But to your question, what did I learn? And I say this a lot because, you know, I look at my agency life before that and I'm going to tell you, especially BBDO, it taught me how to be a great creative. It, they taught me the craft. BBDO was back then what you'd call a, was, was a writer's agency. And so you, that storytelling 
had to be tight. If it wasn't, you weren't going anywhere. You wouldn't have a career. You'd be out of it. And I, of course, I was an art director there, so I had to learn how to write and learn how to tell stories. Um, but the military taught me how to be a leader. And what leadership is, in my perspective and through my experience, is supporting your team. And in the military, they would always talk about, look, your job is not to yell at people, to scream at people. It's to provide beans, bullets, and boots. Make sure that your team has the tools to be successful because their success is your success. If the people around you aren't moving forward, then you're not. So build your team and support your team. And that's where I think my biggest biggest successes have been. Man, the hallelujah. There isn't enough of people talking about that in business in general. You know, too many people get promoted into management without any tools of how to do it. Too many people think it's about them when they're a leader, you know, and the best leaders, I think, I've always thought, are the ones that are just trying to help their team succeed, which takes a lot of energy. You got to, you have to take your own ego out of it and just help these people have the tools and, and the time and the space to do what they need to do and trust people and trust people you know it, it's hard i think for most of us to not be micromanagers and so you give the person the task and then you go okay but do it this way blah, 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 versus saying all right i hired you for this thing you're clearly a subject matter expert and just because i'm your supervisor or your boss you know or whatever term you want to use I hired you to take the lead on this thing. So I need to respect that space so you can actually be successful because no, if some of the things that I might tell you to do could actually keep you from moving forward and being successful. It's so great that you combined that really successful career in advertising and then went into the military and learned those lessons because those aren't the lessons that I think people would expect you would have taken away from the military. But that's usually just because they don't understand how leadership works in the military. You know, and when the stakes are high, whether that's with a client or certainly the stakes are a lot higher in the military, the only way you can truly lead is by making sure the people around you are prepared. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, if you showboat or it's all about you and you're micromanaging, you're probably going to fail. Yeah. Well, and here's the thing, too. <laughs> you know, as a leader in the military, if your team or your soldiers don't believe in you and don't trust you, that's that that's life or death for you as well and and, and i and i don't say that lightly um and so there has to be a culture of care there really does and respect and at the end of the day we're all humans trying to get this stuff done if you don't have that that level of support and respect for each other you won't you won't survive whether it be you know on the battlefield or in the or in the um the business world yeah and that's how i would imagine i've never served but i would imagine why the bond is so strong between people who have served because you know we we throw around a lot of military terms you know of being in a bunker together or being in a foxhole together in advertising and or, you know in business in general but i think truly understanding what that means you know it's why taking care of each other and there's a lot of love in teams and people taking care of each other and looking out for each other. And when it works that way, you get great work, no matter what that work is. You just made me think of it, an example of that. And it was, we were pitching, this was years ago, <laughs> and I believe that, you know, my team is going to stay up late. The pitch was the next morning, but I'm going to stay with them, you know, just to be that cheerleader. <laughs> and my team pulled me aside and said, yeah, that's great. We need you to go home. <laughs> <laughs> because awesome. we're doing all this work and you're going to blow it for us, right? Like, just because like, we, we got this. And I also had to learn that, you know, they're right and, and they do have it. And I've been telling them I trust them and I need to trust them and I need to just go home. And I cherished that moment because they were right. And I was able to get rested and they walked me through the work the next morning. We went in and we killed it. You played your role the way they needed you to play it. Exactly. And they showed I mean, that culture of care wasn't, you know, just top down. It was bottom up. It was side up. It was side, you know, and having that, that that's truly teamwork. Yeah, that really is. I mean, that's the, the hallmark of a fully functioning team. When the team can tell you to get the hell out of here, 
because they need you to be rested for the next day. I said it more politely, yeah. but they're more in line with what you said. Yeah. I mean, you just get out of here, man. <laughs> like we, one, you're just going to bug us. Come yeah. on. Let you us know? do our thing and you better do a good job tomorrow because we put a lot of work into this. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So people that are going into this industry, whether they're, they're curious and they're considering the brand center or they're thinking of going into advertising or creative in, in the many forms it takes, what do you think are some of the most important qualities that you're looking for or that people need to have to go into this industry? I, you know, I think the most important one, we, we touched on it earlier, I think it's being open. And, 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 and this sounds cliche, but also being fearless. You know, like you've got, you've got to, you've got to be a little bit of kooky to be in this industry and, and it's awesome. And, you know, I, I have to be honest with you, you know, when I got into the industry, there weren't many people who looked like me and there were no rules. And I, and I think some of the, the, the subtext of what Mike was saying was, uh, you know, go out, see the world, have those experiences. Maybe folks around us in our industry will grow up a little bit and be ready for that. And, and it's true. And, and I was both fearless and naive and some, a little bit of stupidity goes a long way and it worked for me. <laughs> fearless <laughs> and know? naive are a great combination. Exactly. I mean, ignorance can be bliss sometimes. And, you know, I, and I'll be the first one to say, did I have roadblocks? Did I have, you know, issues around some of the barriers that people talk about? Absolutely. And, I, and those are the things that don't show up in your resume. Um, but what I didn't do was let them stop me. And someone said to me, and I, and I, and I hold on to this. Um, I was having issue with a coworker and it just wasn't right. And I was ready to quit. And they're like, man, don't let anybody steal your joy. Like, why would you give the power of that person, give them that much power over your life? You're going to quit your job. And I thought about it in that moment. I was like, they're right. And then I won't be able to pay my bills and that person is still succeeding. So I modified that and I still use my, you know, I'm not gonna let anybody steal my paycheck. I'm not, you know, you're not gonna let anybody get under your skin so much that you leave something that you love for them. And you don't want to give people that much power in your world, for sure. Definitely. Let's not, as people, let's not cave to the tyranny of unpleasantness, right? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. A hundred percent. Because, you know, we're going to run into it. Some of us more than others, depending on our situation and, you know, persevering and keeping going in a direction you want to go, I think is, you know, it just shows a lot of heart, you know, and I think that, you know, in this industry, you've got to sort of have that, you've got to almost nurture that, that naive, naivete about yourself and have a lot of heart because you're putting out ideas and people bat them down or they don't want to listen to you. And you have to be resilient and a little crazy because you want to keep yeah. doing it anyway. <laughs> There's a little thing that goes on with us in our brains. Well, no, and I and, and I and I want to underscore that point because you're absolutely right. Ideas, we share ideas, they come from a very personal place, in a personal space. And so you have to understand that you're going to hear things about your idea that you love. And I was told earlier, early in my career, like, don't fall in love with your work, respect your work and understand that it has to do something for the client. Um, you can fall in love with the work you put in your portfolio, but the client's not paying for that. But it, even that is a part of growing up in the industry and kind of separating that and understanding that, okay, I can create my own cut of that, or I can build my own thing, but I'm going to serve the, the client's needs, but I'm also getting something great out of it as well. Yeah. And I think that's where it works, you know? when you can have that attitude. And I think it's really painful for a lot of people to, to they do fall in love with their ideas or it's very frustrating for them not to have their ideas accepted, but you still have to just keep that faith and keep coming up with new ones. You have to be a little bit nuts in that it, it just doesn't bother you when you get batted down. Cause I've had plenty of people tell me my idea was terrible and I still came back for more, you know, and it's a part of the love of it. It's a part of the love of it. And I think too, um, you learn by doing and you learn by practice. So there's all this talk around introverts versus extroverts and what you need to do to be in this industry. And I tell people, look, by nature, I'm an introvert. By profession, I'm an extrovert. 
you have to learn how to be able to talk to people and you need to learn how to speak to them. I'm married to an extrovert and she gets her energy from everybody around. I swear it's in the air sometimes. And I'm just like, can we go? I, you know, where's the cave that I can sleep in for three days? But the industry and industry training really does teach you, you can be both. And you, you know, you need to learn how to be out there. And so as a part of that personal exploration and growth and learning the world, it teaches you in its own way how to expand even what you think you are as a person. Yeah. I mean, you can be an introvert and then work on the other side where you have extroverted qualities and nurture those in yourself. And that's part of what's so great about this industry is that it, it is very human. You're, you know, you're helping human beings understand things. You're working with other people and all around an idea, which is an extremely human thing to do, you know, where it's a problem solving in such a strange way. And uh, yeah, I think that's, you know, you, you get a lot of reps doing it and that's where you're really going to learn to not, you know, take it too personally and be able to be a little bit emotionally flexible as you do all these things. So over the years, what's a trait of yours that you used to think was a weakness and, but you've really learned to value? Wow. Okay. I wasn't expecting that. That was a good question. Um, I have a dad sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> I tell really bad jokes yeah, and, and I always find in no matter how serious the, the situation, some connection where I can make a bad, a really bad joke. And, and as I've gotten, um, older, it has diffused some tough, tough moments, but also has brought folks together where we just start laughing and you can kind of move once the laugh starts, you can, move through it and you can like, okay, all right. Yeah. I guess I was being a jerk. Let's, let's, let's try to figure this out because to the, to our earlier point, you're also working with a lot of other creative people who have their own ideas and, and it's selling your ideas and you can be frustrated and then, and then something will happen and you just end up laughing again. We're all crazy. <laughs> so, so it, but, and, and we want joy and we want to have that fun and the pressure of what we do sometimes takes us away from that space. And I think that the dad jokes or the bad jokes um, really bring us back. And I don't do it to be funny. It's just, I just start laughing. What are you laughing at, man? Well, your shoes, right? Like, you know? <laughs> And those are the things that kind of happen. And, and that, I like living in the moment and I like figuring out things in real time. And those have been strengths that I didn't think I had, you know, someone would say, well, you, you wait till the last minute. I'm like, no, but sometimes that great idea actually happens in the car or walking in the room. You're like, I got it. And you got to be ready to do that thing then because you don't want to lose that moment. Yeah. You got to learn how you work. You know, everyone does it differently. And some people you need that, you need to be almost on that edge to get that great idea, you know, and it's part of a process. And I think, you know, I can relate to that. I, I studied and performed improv for years. So that whole yes and part of improv is something that gets me through the difficult times because usually there's humor in literally every sin single situation if you just keep going and you just keep thinking about it. There's, it's, it's just sometimes so ridiculous what we're all arguing about, you know, when you really, if you stop and think what someone else is doing and what we're all arguing about in, the, in this industry, it can be kind of hilarious now and then. And it's also knowing when to just not take yourself so seriously. Absolutely. Yeah. What's something that now you just can't go a day without doing it. What's well, something that now at this point in your career is something you just really have to do every day? So I, I was a, a late bloomer in becoming a dad. And so I, my kids are the most fascinating thing and probably the best thing I've ever created with, a, with my partner. Um, <laughs> I'm glad you didn't do it on your own. <laughs> yeah, that would talk about awkward. That'd be weird. Um, and... You know, there, again, I think it's another example of learning the world. I learned so much by seeing the world through their eyes. And, you know, my son is this kid who knows everything. Like, you're smarter than me at your age than I am now. Like, that's awkward. And, you know, he's the kid who knows every country in the world, 
at age eight, their flag and their capital. And I'm like, I, I don't get it. And whereas my, my, my daughter is like, eh, I like unicorns. I don't care. But even that perspective of she can shrug things off and keep it moving. I'm like, that is awesome. And she's going to live the world and, and exist in this, on this planet her way. And so talking to them and having like real conversations and finding out what their day is. I mean, you know, it's, it's, some people meditate, some people have art as a ritual. My kids bring so much joy to me in their goofy awkwardness. Um, they're truly reflections of my wife and I. And I think that's what really brings me joy and really like is my thing and my energy. And, and the days that I can't speak to them because of travel or because of work, I'm, it's just not the same. Wow, that's really cool, man. The people around us, just if we really spend our time with them and be in the moment with them, that can you've learned so much, you know? It's, that's so cool. With everything you have going on and where you've been, I mean, your journey is really exceptional. What would you name the chap this chapter of your life? Bald and gray guy. No. Um, <laughs> what would? <laughs> it's a simple and memorable name. Yeah, you know, exactly. No, I, it's you know, it's kind of a reawakening, or or the phoenix in the sense that, you know, being a part of the brand center as much as we are of the industry and from the industry, we're actually industry adjacent. And so I've had to change how I think and how we prepare our students for the industry as we move in. And so it's how you look at talent and how you look at talent development. It's very different than I would have thought. The things that we need to train our students for, how we train them is actually different than how it manifests itself in the workplace because it has to be different. And I would have never known that. And so relearning, I've been doing a lot of that. And so um, I think that's the chapter. Like I've had to start from scratch in many ways because ultimately we're here to serve our students. And what, and that's I really 99% of the time, it starts with, are, is this decision being made to prepare our students? If it's not preparing our students and getting them ready, then we need to rethink why we're doing it. That's cool. I mean, that's the hallmark of a successful organization is keeping their customer firmly in mind at all times. And, you know, I think that kind of goes back to what you talked about a little bit with leadership. You know, you're, you're there to make sure they have the tools and you're actually listening at, to your colleagues and trying to implement as a team, not just impose direction. And that's, you know, great leadership. That's what it looks like. So good for you, man. So final question, and then I'll let you go back to your busy day. If you could give your younger self any advice, what would you go back and tell yourself? So this is a random thing, but coming out of the, so I was working at the mall when I talked to Mike Hughes that day. And I really thought he was out of his mind because I thought I had the world, but you know, by the horns and, but I went back to my, work in the mall, I went back to my district manager and said to her, wow, you know, this guy told me that I should leave Richmond, but I got this great job here at the mall. And, you know, I would, so I would tell my younger self, don't be an idiot, like leave. Cause that manager was like convinced me, like, no, you really do need to leave. Like I see the potential in you. And she had to convince me. And I think, I think about what my life would have been had I not taken that leap. And I was pretty close to, to, to not listening to uh, my manager or to Mike. And I think my world would have been, it would have stayed very small. And so I would have, you know, shaken the crap out of me. What are you thinking? Um, that would probably be what I would do. It's like rethink and be okay with taking the leap. Over time I was able to, but back then it was it was a scary it was a scary thing that mike put in front of me yeah good for you man good for you for having the the heart and the guts to just go for it and you know for anyone listening there's so many different ways you can do that you know whether if you can't just pick up and leave the town you're in or you're happy there travel by reading travel by meeting other people and talking to them it's a big world and the more curious we are about other people's stories, the better off we are. And I think that the difference between, you know, the, the 80s and today is you can travel the world from your computer, right? Like from your bedroom, from your kitchen, like you can meet people, you can do all the things that 
um, and just learn and grow from the comfort of your own home and push yourself. Like, don't just stay on Instagram, right? Like, it's not just TikTok. It's what else? You know, where can you learn? Learn, grow. You have access, so do it. Yeah, I think that's a wonderful message to end on because, you know, being endlessly curious about other human beings, what their lives are like, what other people live like, uh, what other people feel and what they hope and dream is really what being part of this industry is all about. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that's really cool stuff, man. Hey, thank you so much for being on the program today. I had a blast talking to you. Hey, this has been awesome. Hopefully we can do it again soon. Want to hear more inspiring stories? Subscribe on your preferred podcast app so you don't miss an episode. And if you like what we're doing, please rate, review, and share. It's the best way to support us. Thank you for listening to Brand Story. Thank you.